Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Sunday, this first Sunday of July. It's the 4th of July weekend. It's also the first Sunday in which we celebrate uh, Holy Communion each and every month. And so I have my elements of Holy Communion, my juice and my cracker. And I would encourage you, if you'd like to, maybe stop this video at this point and go get your elements of Holy Communion and come back and join me because after the message, uh, we're going to move right into the service of Holy Communion and share that together today as we uh, celebrate our nation's freedoms and the freedoms that we have. Hope you'll stay safe this, uh, this weekend and uh, tomorrow as well. Enjoy plenty of good barbecue and go out see some fireworks and y'all be safe. Uh, last week, we looked at a passage of scripture out of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's a life verse for many people. <clears throat> it's one of my life verses that I go to uh, all the time. It reads like this, and we're going to finish the, the, uh, the sermon I started last week today. It says, Trust in the Lord of all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, but all of your ways acknowledge Him, which would be God. Acknowledge God and God will make your paths straight. So the first lesson we learned last Sunday, if you didn't get a chance to hear that message, you can uh, uh, go back to uh, uh, our page on YouTube, Riches and Family Ministries, and find that sermon for last uh, week. And, and uh, yeah, you can watch that first and catch up. But last week we learned the first lesson was Choosing the best paths always begins with God and not us. Now, I know we understand that, but sometimes we don't always get that in the bloodstream, right? You see, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Now, that means that our part is not to trust our hearts, but to trust our hearts to God. Our part is to trust God with our hearts. So it says, trust in the Lord of all your heart. And that word here being trust in Hebrew means to lean fully into with the body. It's a strong word. It means to lay upon. When I trust in the Lord, I rest my whole weight upon God. And so that, that word is important. Trust in the Lord. Lay your whole weight upon God. Depend upon God to hold you up. This is not something when it says I lean into my own understanding. I'm not in, in my trust to God. I'm not leaning towards God, but I'm putting my whole weight on God, and that's important. So the first lesson to learn from the passage is choosing the best path begins with God. The second lesson I learned from this passage is choosing the right paths begins with submission. Not information, not direction. Now that comes later, but submission. And who do we submit to? Well, that answer is easy as well. If you're going to trust in God, you need to submit to God. You see, submission specifically to God who already knows uh, where our path will lead. Now that's important here. This is an easy choice because we submit to the God who knows what's best for us. Even in the hardships and the difficulties of life, it, the, the scripture says that God works to good in all things according to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. God knows the future. We don't. We lean into God. We submit to God's will because God knows what's best for us. He knows even better uh, than I do, uh, especially in what's best for me, and I'm thankful for that. Now, our problem is easily definable. It's independence, right? As we celebrate our independence as a nation, we realize that this wherein could lie some of our problems because we want to do our own thing our own way. Like Frank Sinatra, we love that song, I did it my way. And usually my way is the wrong way, usually. And that is one of the biggest fallings or failings of our American culture, I believe. I think that we are a society that really applauds the self-made man or the self-made woman. We, we love those stories of someone with grit and determination pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, you know, so to speak. We encourage individualism in our uh, culture. We enjoy the stories of those who have blazed the path uh, 
and have become millionaires because of it, great inventions. You see, we celebrate our independence beyond everything else, and that's part of the problem. You see, divine direction begins with unconditional submission and surrender to God. And choosing the best path begins with a posture of not independence, but dependence upon God. This is why the wisdom writer says, listen, lean not onto your own limited understanding. I put that word in there, but it is limited because we don't know the future. We don't know what's going to happen. And so the, 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 the writer of Proverbs here, Solomon says, listen, don't lean onto your own understanding. This word is used for leaning here. It's like leaning against a tree or a stone. In other words, if you trust in Lord, in the Lord, you're going to lean into him. You lean into him with your whole weight. And it says lean to God. You're leaning to God, not to your own understanding. Now, this word understanding, it says here, refers to this mental process by which we analyze a problem. And usually when we analyze the problem, we break it down into smaller parts so that we can understand it better. And then we make a decision about what we're going to do. And that this word understanding, uh, uh, of course, is a decision-making ability that God has given to all of us. It's not a bad word. It's certainly not, <clears throat> it's nothing wrong with thinking about the problem or the situation, breaking it down into parts to determine what we're going to do, that's all good. But when you take the word lean and bring into the idea understanding, and then you add the negative, which is not, the meaning goes something like this. With all your mental powers, listen, do not lean on them for total support. Of course, God wants us to use our minds, our brains, our understanding, but we don't lean on to them with total support. We don't trust in your own ability to figure out your life, but instead lean on the Lord, rest your full weight upon him or submit to the Lord. So we lean into God, not to our own understanding and all of our ways. That's what the, the wisdom writer writes. In all of our ways, not a few of our ways, not in most of our ways, but in all of our ways, we acknowledge him. We acknowledge God. So the word uh, deserves or de uh, extra consideration because this word uh, knowledge, uh, acknowledge can be a hard word to understand. So the, psalm, the, the wisdom writer, I keep calling him the psalmist, but this is in Proverbs. The, the wisdom writer writes, acknowledge God in all of your ways. So in the Hebrew, this word is an imperative. In other words, it's a command. You see, you could translate this by saying, in all of your ways, know God. That's a command. <clears throat> in all of your ways, know God. God, the Hebrew word means to know deeply and to know intimately. So you could say that the uh, writer of Proverbs is saying, listen, uh, trust in the Lord of all your heart, lean unto God with your full understanding, not trusting in your own ability to live your own life the way that you choose or the way that you think or with your limited understanding but acknowledge God in all of your ways. Know God ultimately and intimately. It's the, it's the kind of knowing that comes from a personal relationship, a personal experience. It means to know something through and through. Like I said last week, I know who the president of the United States is. It's uh, Joe Biden. Uh, and I'll just leave that right there. He's the president of the United States for sure. And I know that he is the president, but I don't really know him uh, because I can't pick up my cell phone and give a call and say, hey, Joe, how about knocking them gas prices down a little bit so that it'd make it easy for all of us? That'd be the first thing that I would do. I don't know him that way. 
my wife and I know each other in a completely different way that I know the president. We've known each other intimately for over 35 years. After being together that long, you know, strange things begin to happen when you live with a person that length of time. Have you ever noticed when you're out, the older that a couple gets, especially if they've been married together, you know, together for 50, 60 years, they, they really begin to look like each other, don't they? It's, that's amazing. Have you ever noticed that? <clears throat> There's one thing for sure that they can certainly begin to read each other's minds and thoughts. And I just wonder, how does that happen? You know, when you, <coughs> excuse me, live together for so many years, uh, you, you know each other at such a deep personal level that you can actually begin to fill in the lines or the sentences because you know what the other person is thinking. Uh, you know what your wife is going to say before she says it. You know what your husband is going to do before he does it. Why? Because you have a deep, personal, intimate knowledge of each other. And that's what this word means. In all of your ways, know, acknowledge, know God in an intimate, deeply personal way. That's how we can translate this passage of Scripture. When you know God that way, in every area of your lives, it says, the, the, the wisdom writer says that God then will begin to direct your paths. How does that happen? Because we begin to think the way that God thinks. Not that we become like God, but we can begin to think like God because we know God's ways and we know God's word. And that is so important here. Listen, I think here is our approach to life's decisions in a lot of ways. We just say, Lord, don't really know what I'm doing. Don't really know what you're doing, but I'm just going to pray and trust that you're going to bless it all. Can I get an amen in the house? Yeah. I think we do that a lot, don't we? And we and so many people struggle at this very point in their relationship with God. Listen, the Bible says in all of your ways, know God intimately. Know him deeply. Know him personally. Know him to that depth and knowing him with that kind of intimacy brings benefits in our life. See, so often we skip this and we try and figure it out on our own. When we get up in the morning, we say, oh God, help me. I've got a busy day. Nothing wrong with asking God to help you to have a busy day, but usually it goes something like this. I've got so much to do, Lord, that I don't even have time to pray. So here's my list. I'm just gonna give it to you. And I ask that you uh, bless it all, Lord, and here I go wide open, right? We uh, throw our list up to heaven while we run out the door. And what we're saying is, God, here's my schedule. I don't really have time to know you, to, to, to speak with you, to seek you, to keep knocking at the door and keep seeking. You don't have time for all of that. But Lord, just please rubber stamp it with your blessing today. In other words, uh, Lord, here it is. I, I'm, I'm going to go out and do it for you. And, uh, uh, Lord, I, I just pray that you would rubber stamp it with your blessing. And we wonder why our days are filled at times with so many frustrations and roadblocks. Many of us go through life leaning most completely on our own understanding. Why? Because we like to be in control. We like to know what's going to happen. And I really number myself among that group as well. So I'm not... If I point a finger this way, I've got two or three pointing back at me. I understand that. You see, not that I like to admit it, but I understand it. I, I like to know what's going on. I, I like to be in charge. That This passage really is a wake-up call to all of us who lay our life, who live our life the way that we want to live it. Not that we're living a bad life, but we just sort of don't acknowledge God in all of our ways. Maybe we don't want to bother God with the small details of life, just the big stuff. So we don't acknowledge God in all of our ways. And then we say, Lord, <clears throat> here, here, here's my life. Here's my list. Stamp it with your blessing because I'm going to go out uh, and uh, do it all for you anyway. And God says, you know, I really don't work that way, Riley. And God doesn't work that way. God says, know me first. Get to know me. Get to know my ways. Get to know my word. Love me. Seek me. Pray with me. 
have a relationship with me. Put me first in everything, including your plans, including your thinking, and including all of your scheming. Just go ahead and let me have full access, submit, surrender to God's will. Put me first. And then the psalmist says, and God will make your path straight. You know, it's so easy. Uh, it's so easily, e easily theologically and mentally, uh, but it's so difficult for us to take that up here and allow it to transfer this uh, foot or two uh, to our heart to where it really can grow and bear fruit. Do you know, uh, do you want to know the secret of knowing God's will? And people's written books about this. It's so simple. It's so easy. It's not rocket science or brain surgery. Here it is. <clears throat> Here's the secret of knowing God's will. You got a pen, piece of paper, write this down. In everything that you do, know God. Know God intimately, personally, lovingly. Know God's ways, know God's word, and know God's will begins with that relationship with the Lord. In light of this text, what is the will of God for your life? To know God in everything. To lean not on my own understanding. To lean fully unto God. To see God present everywhere and in everything. And to live in total surrender unto him. Listen, the most important thing is not the decisions that you have faced in life. They're going to come. The most important thing is in understanding how God leads your past. If you want God to lead your past and all things, the most important thing is your relationship with God. Because the closer you get to God, the easier it will be for God to guide you in the way that God needs you to go. You see, it is so simple. You know, life is this really mysterious journey, isn't it? It's full of unexpected <clears throat> twists and turns, and you've experienced those yourself. The path ahead is a mystery to all of us. Now, I know ultimately where I'm going in life, I, I, and that is to heaven. I know, I know that because I have accepted the Lord Jesus <clears throat> as my Lord and Savior. But I don't know what's going to happen to me next week, next day, or the next 10 minutes from now, I have to simply trust in God that in all things God is leading me because of that relationship that I have with him. I want to know God's ways. So the path ahead is a mystery to all. No one can say for sure what's going to be around the next bend or the next curve in life. It could be a smooth road. It could be a lovely valley. Or you may discover that the bridge is washed out. You've got to find a detour. The seas are, are, uh, are stormy, and uh, you've got to drop your sails. You've got to alter your course. Uh, uh, often the road seems to disappear sometimes. It maybe even suddenly seems to go in three or four different directions, and we don't know where to go because our battery on our smartphones has gone out. Uh, that happens, doesn't it? But there is one who knows the way, there is one who knows our way because the past, the present, and the future are all the same to God. The psalmist says <clears throat> that even, God, even the darkness is like light unto God. When we look out into our existence and our world and we see dark things, understand this, it's not dark to God. God sees the light. And what God is trying to do is to it is to help direct our path so that we won't walk deeper into darkness, but we'll find the light, that we'll find the way, that we'll find God's direction. There is one who knows the way because he is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and forever. There is one who knows the way because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He knows the way that we should go. God has promised to direct our path, and God would do it, and we can count on the Lord. And for those who understand that, trust in the Lord of all of their heart. They don't lean on their own understanding, but in all of their ways, they know and acknowledge God. And then the scripture says, and God will direct our paths. Amen and amen. We're going to move right into uh, 
the service of Holy Communion. And uh, if you would take out uh, uh, your uh, elements of Holy Communion and place those before you, and we're going to go through the great thanksgiving and uh, the invitation, confession, and pardon, great thanksgiving, and we'll serve together. So the invitation to Holy Communion is simply this. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And I'm going to read this prayer of confession, uh, and uh, you can pray along with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love, and we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And after the confession, where we've confessed our sin before God, I want to take just for a few moments and ask that you just lift up any confession that you would like to make to the Lord right now. And I'm going to do the same and I'm going to confess that I don't always lean into God with full trust. I don't always acknowledge God in everything in my life, and that's a sin. And I'm going to confess that to the Lord and ask him to help me in all things. Acknowledge him so he can direct my paths. Let us pray. Amen. And amen. Now hear the hear the pardon. <clears throat> hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That's proof of God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And you say in the name of Jesus Christ, I am forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. <clears throat> now we move to the great thanksgiving, and I say the Lord be with you, and you say, and also with you, all with me. Let us lift up our hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord our God because it's a good and right and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, creator of heaven and earth. And so with all of your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn as we say together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy and blessed are you is your son, Jesus Christ, by his baptism, suffering, and death. You gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by the water and by the spirit. On the night in which the Lord gave himself up for us, he took bread. He blessed it. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take it, eat, for this is my body given for you. <clears throat> Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take and drink, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Say it with me. Christ is died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on our elements of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church, in all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen and amen. I want to encourage you to go ahead and take uh, uh, the elements of Holy Communion and uh, I'm taking uh, the cracker. Uh, this is actually matzah. <clears throat> and we break it together. Christ uh, gave his life for us. And he said, this is my body. Take and eat.
the blood of Jesus Christ, take and drink. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for these gifts of bread and wine, your body and your blood. We thank you, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, that you died for us, rose again, and gave us eternal life. You'll even come again and receive us unto yourself. Lord, help us to know you, to know you intimately, personally, in a loving way. Help us to know your ways and your word so that we can know your will. Help us in all of our ways to acknowledge who you are in our life and help us to trust, to lean upon you with our full weight and all that we do. Amen and amen. Well, I hope you have a blessed uh, Sunday. And I pray that you have a, a, a wonderful 4th of July celebration. Uh, Angie and I and our family are going to uh, smoke some ribs and some chicken. Uh, have a little potato salad, baked beans, and uh, even got a watermelon. And then uh, tomorrow night, late, we're going to uh, be in downtown Pensacola to watch one of the largest uh, fireworks celebrations here on the Gulf Coast. So it's going to be a great weekend, a great day today as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion in the church with our church people. Uh, and then tomorrow, the, our great independence as a nation with our church family uh, and with others. So God bless you. Have a great day. Go in peace. May the peace of God be with you. Amen. <laughs>